All right, so this, uh, we continue in our series, uh, Lessons from the Kings, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. This is lesson number 11 in that series. And uh, this particular lesson, The Life and Times of Hezekiah, this is part two, because we've done a couple of lessons on King Hezekiah, as I mentioned. So we're studying the life and times of actually one of the greatest kings of the Jewish people, Hezekiah, king of the southern kingdom during the divided kingdom era. Uh, his name meant strengthened by the Lord, strengthened by the Lord. And um, we see this uh, feature throughout his reign. He really, <laughs> he really was a man who was strengthened by the Lord. A Little bit of background about him, just to review the things that we've learned so far. Uh, he became king of Judah, the southern kingdom, in 716 BC. There used to be a, some uh, debate among scholars about the accuracy of that, but uh, eventually they um, uh, discovered that he reigned as co-regent with his father, beginning in 729 BC, and then when his father died, he became uh, king in 716 BC, which uh, is, explains the discrepancy in some uh, in some um, historical material. Uh, at that time, when he became king, he was 25 years old, um, the southern kingdom of Judah was isolated between two great world powers of the time, Egypt uh, to the south and Assyria to the north. And both of these powers were vying to take over this territory because they wanted a buffer zone between you know, their countries and they wanted a place, to, a jumping off place to, you know, to war against one another. So uh, little Judah was stuck in between these two uh, great powers. Um, Hezekiah's father, we mentioned last time, Ahaz had been a, an evil king, had led the nation into idolatry, had made foolish political alliances against God's will and the warnings that he had received through the prophets not to make these political alliances, military alliances, which he went ahead and did anyways. When Hezekiah took over, he began a, an immediate national reform, which included several important um, initiatives. And this is what we talked about in our first lesson. Uh, he tore down the altars and the images that the people had been worshiping at. He, uh, he restored the temple itself. It had been closed, actually. Uh, the work of the priests, the work of the Levites. He encouraged all the people to return to a faithful worship of the Lord. Uh, he tried to invite all the people uh, to return to uh, faithful worship, not just the common people, but the leaders as well, the people uh, of the kingdom. He even reached out to the people in the north uh, to try to encourage them to return uh, to uh, faithful uh, worship. Not many of them came, but some of them did. Many re rebuffed his uh, effort. Uh, they had been separated from the kingdom for, for decades, and uh, Hezekiah reached out to them, an important part of his ministry. Uh, with this national renewal came also a renewal of the economy, which enabled him to mount up an army and defeat their traditional enemy, the Philistines, uh, which were a constant uh, nuisance to them, always raids and you know, uh, territorial wars going on with the, uh, with the Philistines. Finally, finally, he had the money to raise up an army to, uh, to defeat them, to put them in their place. And he also paid or stopped paying tribute or taxes to the Assyrians who guaranteed peace in exchange for a large amount of their national wealth. So Hezekiah felt confident enough to throw off the yoke of slavery and break free from Assyrian threats and Assyrian domination, uh, which brings us to our lesson today. This particular action, throwing off, not paying any more tribute to Assyria, uh, brought about the most serious crisis in his reign. And the Bible describes the results of this decision by Hezekiah and how Hezekiah re responded to the subsequent Assyrian uh, threat. So um, the story of uh, this response, Hezekiah's response to the threat of the Assyrians is found in three places actually, you have to kind of dig around for them. Second Kings chapters 18 and 19, Second Chronicles chapter 32, and the book of Isaiah chapters 36 and 37. Uh, it's interesting to note that the details are similar in Second Kings and Second Chronicles. 
However, the account in Isaiah chapter 36 and 37 is identical word per word as the one that is recorded in 2 Kings. So if you're reading through your Bible and you read 2 Kings and then you move on to Isaiah and you say, I got the feeling that I read this before. Well, you have read it before, it's word per word. Since Isaiah was an eyewitness of the events themselves, it is his record that is the original record. Even though Isaiah comes in the book, in the Old Testament, Isaiah comes after you know, Kings and Chronicles, chronologically, historically, he comes before. Okay? Uh, one of the reasons uh, for that uh, is that um, uh, Kings and Chronicles are history books, and so they're grouped together as history. Um, uh, Isaiah obviously is a prophet, a major prophet, and the major prophets were grouped together after the history and were you know, put together, the, the four uh, major prophets. So that kind of explains that uh, uh, difficulty um, as far as the chronology is concerned. Uh, we're going to use the accounts of this event in Kings and Chronicles because it also includes more details than the original one in Isaiah, which was the eyewitness account, but which does not have certain speeches and details compiled by later uh, authors. So let's take a look at um, the response to uh, Hezekiah's rebellion. Hezekiah rebels. What happens after he rebels in chapter uh, 18, 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 13. It says, now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. Then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lashish, saying, I've done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. So the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Hezekiah gave him all the silver which was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorposts which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. So Hezekiah here refuses to pay any more tribute, no more money. So in response, the Assyrians come into Judah, into the territory, and they take over the fortified cities. Uh, an important point we need to kind of pause and look at. It talks about Lashish. Uh, fortified cities were strategically located to protect main roads and supplies, um, also had troops located in those places in case of attacks. They were kind of early warnings, you know what I'm saying? It was these fortified cities. Uh, they weren't very, very large by today's standards. You know, we say a city, I mean, but we're talking about acres here, you know, 40 acres, 60 acres, 80 acres maybe, that was the city. It was like a big fort, uh, if you wish. Uh, it was surrounded by, uh, usually surrounded by a 10 to 20, 20 foot thick wall, um, and it had towers and a gate, uh, a gate wide enough to drive a, a chariot uh, through. Now, the point of taking these, uh, and that, uh, that diagram I just showed you, that's Lashish, that's the diagram of Lashish, how, you know, the, the composition of that fortified city, and this is the archeological dig of Lashish today, and if you noticed, I guess it would be to, to your right there, that little mound there that you see just on the right corner there, that's the ramp that the Assyrians built to go up and attack the city um, at the time. So the point here, uh, the military strategy um, point, was to demonstrate Assyria's total military dominance over the Jews and the helplessness of the final city. In other words, they take over, they take over the fortified city. That's where all the soldiers are. That's where all the weapons are. That's, that's supposed to be the strength, the protection. Well, they just go in and just knock these over one after another. And it's a message to Jerusalem, the main city, which is not a fortified city necessarily, but it's the main population city where the temple is, the money is, and the, the leaders are. It's a message to them, if we can take these cities, it won't be anything to go in and take that city. That, that, was, the, that was the message they were saying. Now, God was originally displeased with the building of these cities in the first place because they symbolize the nation's trust in their own strength and not necessarily in the power of God to save them. Remember, 
you know, Israel, Judah, this was a theocracy, not a democracy, it was a theocracy. The people understood that God was their king and God was their protector. And so as they built these cities, uh, they were demonstrating less faith in God, more faith in their arms. So their taking, therefore, was also um, an act of judgment by God over, their Jew, over the Jews for their faithlessness. So Hezekiah, in what we've just read, realizes the danger that he's in and the helplessness of the situation, and he seeks to humble himself, not before God, but before the Assyrian king, and work out a peace treaty with him. So in return for a promise of peace to the, Assyrian demand, uh, to the Assyrians, the Assyrians demand an enormous payment. I mean, millions and millions of dollars in today's money. Um, uh, we see Hezekiah even removing the gold from the temple in order to make up you know, the amount of money that they needed to give to the Assyrians to stop them from coming in and destroying the city. Um, after receiving their money, the, the Assyrians changed their minds and they decide to attack anyways. This was the treachery here. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, the writer describes the preparations that Hezekiah made to protect the city from Sennacherib's army. He strengthened the walls uh, and the doors of the city. He, um, he enclosed the, the people and encouraged them to trust uh, the Lord and to live uh, for the Lord. And he also secured the city's water supply. Remember, what was going to happen here was a siege. A uh, siege was, you know, the invading army would surround a city and starve them out. It's an old tactic, but it's a tactic that's been used even in modern day warfare, right? Uh, Germany laid siege to Leningrad, right? Second World War, trying to starve them out, and millions of people died and starved. Well, this is what Sennacherib was going to do. He was going to surround Jerusalem and just wait. And why lose a man? Why lose a soldier? Why fire a shot? They'll all be dead in a little while. These soldiers, you know, they're not, they don't have a union. <laughs> They'll stay there as long as they have to stay there. If it takes a year or two, so what? So that's the plan and, and, and Hezekiah gets ready for that particular type of battle. Now the uh, water supply. Um, the problem with the city of Jerusalem at the time was that its water supply, the source of it was outside the city walls. So when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was going to lay siege, he devised a plan to stop uh, the, um, uh, stop the uh, spring that provided the water and divert that spring through a tunnel into the city. The net result would be there would be no water for the Assyrians on the outside, but there'd be plenty of water for the Jews or for the, the inhabitants of the city on the inside. And interesting how they did this, two crews began to dig the tunnel, one beginning at the springs where the origin, or the origin of the water is, and one from inside the city itself, where the pool was, where the water eventually uh, flowed to, and the idea was that they'd kind of meet you know, uh, in the middle. And so this little diagram here shows the city of Jerusalem you know, in relief, and that blue streak, this is, this is where the water uh, uh, the water was. It started in a, in a spring which was just outside the city wall as you see and it worked its way underneath and it ended in the pool. I think it's the pool of Siloam there. That's where the water would eventually uh, discharge. Interesting, in 1880 the tunnel was accidentally rediscovered by a young boy who was swimming in the area. Uh, the boy found an inscription on a rock which read, and I quote, the tunnel was completed while the hewers wielded the ax, each man toward his fellow. There was heard a man's voice calling his fellow. The hewers hacked towards each other, ax against ax, and the water, flowing, or the water flowed spring against pool, a difference of 1,200 cubits. The inscription that describes the successful building of the tunnel is now in the Istanbul Museum, which is in, uh, which is in Turkey. So by doing this, Hezekiah denied water to the enemy and their chief weapon, 
and provided water for the city during the siege. And if you've ever been to Israel, it gets very hot there in the summer. If you have no water, you, you can't last uh, very long. Uh, the tunnel is still in existence uh, today and you can visit it. I've actually visited, I didn't crawl through, but I, you know, I saw the opening where you could go uh, through it. It's 300 yards long. It's big enough that a person can walk through. It's all, under, it's all underground, just a marvel of ancient uh, technology. So let's read uh, 2 Kings chapter uh, uh, 18, beginning in verse 17. It says, Then the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lashish to King Hezekiah with a large army to Jerusalem. So they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they went up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is on the highway of the fuller's field. When they called out to the king, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to them. Then Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What is this confidence uh, that you have? You say, but they are only empty words, I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom do you rely that you have rebelled against me? Now behold, you rely on the staff of this crushed reed, even on Egypt, on which if a man leans, it'll go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who rely on him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and has said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Now therefore come, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you're able uh, on your part to set riders on them. How then can you repulse one official of the least of my master's servants and rely on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Have I now come up without the Lord's approval against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. So the king sends his officials to negotiate a surrender in order to avoid a long and drawn out siege. The speech by the Assyrian nobleman there is a model of the tactics of humiliation and bullying. I mean, he tells them that they are foolish to trust in Egypt. So remember I told you God was displeased because they made alliances? That was one of the alliances. They had made an alliance with Egypt to protect them if the northern enemy would attack them. And this guy here is saying, you're depending on Egypt? That, you know, if you lean on that, it'll, it'll pierce your hand. You know, they're useless, we can take them. Um, he also says that they are foolish to trust in God. And here the Asterian mistakenly thinks that God was angry with the Jews for removing the altars and the idols throughout the land and demonstrates his true ignorance of the true and living God. And he says, you know, God is mad at you because you took away his altars you know, in the high places. And Well, no, that was part of the reformation that Hezekiah did right at the beginning. He got rid of the idols, he got rid of the altars, he got rid of the Asherah poles, he got rid of all of that. No, God was pleased that he did that because worship was to be only in Jerusalem. This was before the days of synagogues. In those days, there were no synagogues. Synagogues only began when the Jews were in, um, 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 they exiled. Uh, they were in exile. They were away from Jerusalem. They had to pray somewhere. So they began to pray in homes and so on and that while they were in exile. It was like home church, if you, house churches, if you wish, houses of prayer. And they, they, they took that idea and brought it back with them to Judah after the exile, and that's where the synagogue system began. So in those days, there were no synagogues. You went and prayed in Jerusalem. So the Assyrian envoy makes the mistake of saying, oh, God is mad at you because you took down all those altars and everything, when the opposite was true. No, God was pleased because of that. Um, they also suggest that it was God who had sent them on this mission how little they realized how close they were to the truth. Yeah, God had sent them on this mission, all right, but not for the reasons that they thought. So at this point in time, the Assyrian king was securing one of the fortified cities. Remember it says Lashish, I show you the picture. He was, for, he was fighting against that city. It was probably their strongest fortified city. And the point is, he sends his envoy and says, look, when I'm finished with Lashish, I'm coming to Jerusalem. So let's negotiate now, let's, you know, 
let's not have any ugly business, you know, surrender now and uh, we'll, we'll, make a, we'll make a treaty. So now we have the, um, the now that was strategy, you know, that was, he was psyching out the, the Jewish. Now he goes further uh, to insult in 2 Kings 18, continuing in verse 26. He says, then Eliakim, the son of Helkiah and Shebna and Joah said to Rabshakeh, speak now to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it, and do not speak with us in Judean uh, in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But Rabshakeh said to them, has my master sent me only to your master and to you to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall, doomed to eat their own dung and drink their uh, urine uh, with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in Judean, saying, hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you from my hand. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me, and come out to me, and eat each of his vine, and each of his fig tree, and drink each of the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. But do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his, his uh, land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hina and Eva? Have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among the gods of the lands have delivered their land from my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? But the people were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shibna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of Rabshakeh. So here we see the enemy really indulging in um, provocation and, and, and cross the line as far as worship of the Lord is concerned. He speaks to the people in their own language to intimidate and to spread propaganda among them. That's why he talks in their own language. He tells the people that Hezekiah is a liar, that if they surrender, they're going, you know, he says, hey, a land of milk and honey, everybody will have their own tree, everybody's going to have their own property, drink from your own cistern, means you've got your own place, you know, you, we're going to take you to a wonderful place, a wonderful land where you're going to have a wonderful time, you know, a good life, not cringing in Jerusalem you know, for two years or three years, you know, ultimately dying of starvation. No, 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 don't listen to Hezekiah. He's a liar, He's, you know, he, can't, he can't save you. Um, and of course, knowing Jewish religion, he even goes further and tells the people not to trust in the Lord. He didn't protect these other nations, did he, he says? And so he won't be able to protect them either. Of course, as we said, he didn't really understand who God was and who these people uh, were, right? Because in uh, 2 Chronicles 32, 19, it says, they, they, meaning the Assyrians, they spoke of the God of Jerusalem as the gods of the peoples of the earth, the work of men's hands. That was their main mistake. They misunderstood who the God of the Jews were. And so Hezekiah's officials are first of all insulted, then they mourned the impending attack, but the people remained silent because that was the order of the king. So when Hezekiah hears the news, he goes immediately and humbly to the temple to seek God's help. He then finds Isaiah, the prophet, in order to receive instruction from the Lord. That's the same thing as when you're having an issue or a problem or a difficulty and you go to the Bible to find instruction, to find comfort, to find encouragement. Well, Isaiah you know, was a living Bible. He was the prophet. He spoke from God. So the king goes to Isaiah. What do we do? What would the Lord have us do? So Isaiah receives a word from the Lord which tells Hezekiah three things. First of all, he tells him, don't be afraid. He comforts him. I know you have a reason to be afraid, but don't. Number two, he says, Assyria is not just attacking the Jews, they've attacked God Himself with their, uh, with their arrogance. And number three, 
Isaiah even describes how God will deal with them. They will withdraw from the city to fight on another front and then the king will return to his city and be killed. In other words, Isaiah prophesies ahead of time what's going to happen. Okay. So Hezekiah holds fast and he encourages the people to trust in the Lord. In chapter 19, verses eight to 13, we read, just as Isaiah said, the Assyrian army is called back to fight on another front. And the other front is the Egyptians. The Egyptians realize that the Assyrians have moved in and have a, like a major attack going not far from their, from their lines. So they move an army towards the Assyrian army to rebuff them, to push them back. And that delays the siege of Jerusalem uh, as Sennacherib is you know, deflected, has to go now and take care of the uh, Egyptian onslaught. Okay? But the envoy continues to threaten by telling them not to think that this is a sign from God. He says, look, we were going to come you know, next week and take care of business, and now we got something else to do. Don't think this is God saving you. We're going to go take care of this other matter, and then we're going to come right back and continue with you people. So don't think you've been saved here. Okay. So when Hezekiah receives this message, he once again goes to the Lord in prayer. In this prayer, we see that Hezekiah realizes the main difference between the Jewish nation and the other nations destroyed by the Assyrians. These other nations lost because their God was not the Lord. Hezekiah knew this very important fact and this gave him confidence. So his answer in verse 19 shows that he put his full confidence in God for deliverance despite the very real physical threat before him. Now again, I'm just summarizing, there's just way too much material to read here in the little half hour that we have, so I'm just summarizing the story, okay? So once Hezekiah prays and puts his confidence in God for salvation, he receives a word of confirmation from Isaiah the prophet. Note that Hezekiah first took a step of faith before God responded to him in reassurance. He prays to God, God tells him, don't be afraid, this is going to happen, and what does he do? He waits. Instead of renegotiating with you know, the Assyrians and ignoring what God says, he waits. He waits for God to act. The point I'm making here is that sometimes just waiting is an act of faith. We think faith is always, I'm going to do something. But sometimes I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to wait. Sometimes that's the most difficult act of faith to, to do. And that's what Hezekiah does. He just waits. All right? So Isaiah's message is threefold. So let's, um, let's read that here. 2 Kings 19, 20. Isaiah says, uh, Then Isaiah, the son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard you. This is the word that the Lord has spoken against him. She has despised you and mocked you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She has shaken her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? And against whom have you raised your voice and haughtily lifted your eyes against the Holy One of Israel? Through your messengers you have reproached the Lord, and you have said, with my many chariots I came to the heights of the mountains, to the remotest parts of Lebanon, and I cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypresses, and I entered its farthest lodging places, its thickest forests. I dug wells and drank foreign waters, and with the sole of my feet I dried up all the rivers of Egypt. In a very poetic fashion, Isaiah is talking about the Assyrians and what they've done. Okay. He cites Assyria's sin, which was insulting the Lord, calling Him weak, comparing Him to other gods, not respecting His people. Goes on to say, Have you not heard? Long ago I did it. From ancient times I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass that you should turn fortified cities into ruinous heaps. In other words, Isaiah is saying, you Assyrians, you're doing this because the Lord has permitted you to do this, has directed you to do this for His own purposes. Therefore their inhabitants were short of strength. 
They were dismayed and put to shame. They were as the vegetation of the field and as the green herb, as grass on the housetops is scorched before it is grown up. In other words, your enemies fell before you because I gave you the strength to overcome them. He's talking about the Assyrians now. He's saying to the king of Assyria, you think you're smart, you think you're great, you're insulting me, don't you realize from long ago I planned everything that you've done? Goes on, he says, but I know you're sitting down and you're going and you're coming in, meaning I know you, I know you inside out, I know everything you do and you're raging against me. Because of your raging against me and because your arrogance has come up to my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips and I will turn you back by the way uh, which you came. So he tells Ezekiah what he will do with the Assyrians. The same treatment that they've given their conquered nations, he's going to give to them. Continues on and says, Then this shall be the sign for you. You will eat this year what grows of itself, and the second year what springs from the same, and in the third year sow, reap, plant vineyards, and eat their fruit. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah will again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem go forth a remnant, and out of Mount Zion survivors. The zeal of the Lord will perform this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he will not come to this city or shoot an arrow there, and he will not come before it with a shield or throw up a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, by the same he will return, and he shall not come to this city, declares the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. So he reassures Hezekiah that no one in Jerusalem will be harmed and they will not suffer because of the Assyrian threat. As a matter of fact, the city will prosper and continue to be blessed. You know, the idea this year you'll eat the crops and then the next year you'll eat the leftover crops from this year and then the third year. In other words, life is just going to go on as usual. Okay? You will prosper. Not one arrow, meaning there will be no battle. There will be no, not an arrow, in other words, not a, not a shot will be fired. Assyria will be defeated without firing a shot. So Hezekiah acted by faith on what he knew to be true about God. Isaiah comes to confirm that his prayer and faith were heard and answered. And so God then destroys the Assyrians. Second Kings, let's just read that, verse 35. It says, then it happened that night that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. It came about as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, Nisroch, his god that Adramelech and Sharezer killed him with the sword and they escaped into the land of Ararat and Esarhaddon, his son, became king in his place. Now some historians and commentators think it was a plague of some kind that killed them, but archeological records show that after their initial siege, the Assyrians did not complete their attack. And normally, historically, these nations would write extensively about their victories. When they won, there's a lot of records about what they did and how many people they killed and the booty they took and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's a zero record about this attack on Jerusalem. So this here also historically marked the beginning of the end of the Assyrian Empire because approximately 70 years later, it fell to the Babylonian, um, the Babylonian nation never to uh, discover, uh, never to recover rather. Uh, in chapters 32, uh, we won't read it, uh, there's a dis uh, description of the uh, destruction in detail and Hezekiah's subsequent blessings. Again, we don't have time to read that. Um, their destruction, however, if there's a lesson in this, their destruction began with Hezekiah's prayer to God who had the power to overthrow them or any nation he chooses to overthrow. And that's why I find Isaiah's message there quite uh, Hmm. quite uh, fearful, you know. He says, he's talking directly to the king. You know, you've insulted me, you're going to pay for this. And sure enough, sure enough, he did pay for it. So, you know, this series is entitled Lesson from the Kings. Lesson. What lessons? Well, there's, 
plenty of lessons, but I've chosen two, I think, that are just you know, demanding to be heard. Lesson number one, if it's not protected by God, it's not protected. I think God allowed the Jews to be stripped of every outward protection before He saved them in order to show that if, if you're not protected by the Lord, it doesn't matter who's protecting you. It doesn't matter. Now I'm not saying, you know, I, I'm not saying some say, so I'm not a complete pacifist. You know, we shouldn't have an army. You know, policemen shouldn't carry weapons. You know, I, I don't mean that. I'm not saying we should eliminate armies and defense. I mean, God Himself used armies, didn't He? He used warriors. David, you know, in one of his Psalms, says that God taught him the art of war. It was God who taught him how to be a good soldier. So uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you have not put your life into God's hands, your army, your wealth, your strength, your ability, your company will not be enough to protect you. That's my point. That's my point. Lesson number two, and there's only two. God watches out for His own. We think that God caring for His people, you know, that's an Old Testament concept because in the Old Testament we see so much direct intervention between God and the people, God and the kings, that we don't see necessarily today. But my thought is, if God took this kind of care for the people who serve to prepare for the coming of the kingdom. Imagine the kind of care and interest that God takes in the people of the kingdom. These people were preparing for the kingdom of God to be established. We're in the kingdom of God that has been established. If God took care of the people who were preparing the kingdom, imagine the care He takes for the people of the kingdom. You know, David also said, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. It's, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes um, um, it's easy to become hard-hearted with the advent of the 24-hour news cycle. When I was uh, you know, a kid, the news came on once a day, right? 6 p.m., you'd watch the news or the late news, maybe at 11, which was the same news. Or you'd have the afternoon newspaper and the evening newspaper, and that was it. And there was a finite, once you, you went through the, you know, the front pages and the editorial, and you got to the sports page, you know, there was a finite, okay, I've read the paper. I've got the news for the day, this is what's happening. But today, the news just, it doesn't end. It just, there's so much of it. I have an app on my, on my uh, iPad that's called News, and what it does is I chose like 50 different periodicals, okay? 50 different newspapers, magazines, you know, whatever. 50 different sources of information. And this service here simply gleans the, you know, the top stories of these things and packages them together as headlines and synopsis. And, and, and when I go to that app, you know, it says, today we've picked 175 stories for you. 175 stories, and if I wait two hours, I can come back, they've got another 40 or 50 more than I can, that I could read. And the net result of that is we become hard-hearted. Oh, another mass killing, oh well. If this is Wednesday, it must be another mass killing somewhere. You know, I mean, it's, of course it's tragic. But eventually we just become hardened to it. You know, we, yeah, okay. Uh, how many did they kill this time? Oh, they only killed nine this time. Well, it's not as bad as the one in California, I guess. We, you know, a war, you know, a, a, plane blow, a plane blows out of the sky. 200 innocent people are blown out of the sky by some murderous terrorist. And we go, oh, wow, that's, that's terrible. What are we having for supper tonight? Is it pot roast night? So we begin sometimes to transpose that type of feeling onto God. 
because we think that God is like us, that He becomes hardened. And He sees all the stories, He sees all the people. Eh, one more person dead, one more person alive, no big deal. But we have David here through the Spirit of God that says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His godly ones. Every single one of those who belong to Him, He cares about. He's not like us. He doesn't become hardened. And I remind you also, everybody in the world is God's creation, but not everybody in the world are God's children. There's a difference. Everyone deserves respect as a human being because they're a creation of God. They're made in His image. That's why we have laws. You know, you, if you murder somebody, you go to jail, or if you abuse someone, or if you harm someone. You know, originally the idea, you've harmed someone in the image of God, someone precious. You should be punished for that. So everyone is in you know, the image of God, but not all are children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And these are the people he's talking about here. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones, not his human ones, his godly ones. That's us. Let that be an encouragement to us that God cares about all of us, each of us individually as much as one another. Okay, a couple of lessons from uh, great King Hezekiah. We got one more uh, lesson to do in the Syria on Hezekiah and then we'll, we'll move on to another king. That's it for today. Thank you for your attention.